Hello everyone. If you've ever used line lemur before, you know that it looks simple on the outside and that it gets pretty complicated pretty fast. Um, but I wanted to make this video because I like to start from scratch and hopefully help you to understand things that you never did before about how to use this software. All right, I'm going to assume that you've already downloaded lemur. If not, you can find it on their website. Just click downloads and then download the software. You might also want to grab the manual while you're at it. Once you get it downloaded and installed and open it up, it should look something like this. So as you know, Lemur allows you to build interfaces, which lets you control instruments or other applications via MIDI or OSC messaging. First, let's talk about the center area. This is essentially your canvas where you'll be building your interface. You see a rectangle, and that represents the outline of the area in which you can add elements. The size and shape of that outline is determined by this pop-up on the top right. Now currently it's set to iPad. If we were to change this to iPhone 5 or 5S for example, it'll ask us if we would like to automatically stretch all of our objects. Well, we don't really care because we don't have any objects, so that's just fine. As you can see, the rectangle got smaller. This represents a smaller screen on the iPhone 5 or 5S. Have a look at the iPad Pro. In this case, the rectangle is bigger than our screen, which means we have to scroll to see the boundaries. Now clearly, an interface has to be designed based around a particular screen size, so it's best if you decide early on what type of device you'll be building this for. In my case, I'm building it for an iPad, so I'll choose iPad. Let's add a couple of objects to our interface here. Let's add a knob and a fader. Now, on the bottom left you see an, our objects panel and you see the properties tab of the objects panel has been selected. We can also click the behavior tab to see that. But in the properties tab we see the name of this object. Currently it's just called fader, but we could call it volume for example. Now the name of an object is important and it appears in several places. For example, on the bottom right in our project panel, there's a list of all the objects in our interface. Here you can see that the word volume appears, just as I renamed it over here in the properties panel. Similarly, if I click on the knob and rename it, I might call it uh, filter cutoff. The name also appears in the project panel. Now you notice I typed filter space cutoff, but it removed the space. And that's because these names are also used in scripts and variables and custom functions, all of which we'll talk about later. But suffice it to say, these names are extremely important to your interface and to controlling things in Lemur. Now if you have an iPad or iPhone and you own the Lemur app, you may want to connect to it. To do that, open the app on your iPad press the play button in the top right and as long as your iPad or other device is on the same network as your computer it should show up in this list automatically and you can just press connect. You may also want to press the sync button so that any changes made on your iPad interface are also reflected in the editor. If you don't have an iPad that's fine we're really not going to be concentrating on the app version of the Lemur editor. Now before going any further I'd like to rearrange my interface a bit to make it easier to work with. For one thing, I'd like the project panel to take up more space and the creation panel to take up less space. I can click and drag on the gray header of any panel and move it to another location. You can see when lines or boxes start to show up, those represent where the panel will be located to when you let go. Alright, that's a good start. Now. The mapping section, I'd like to move down below my project. I want to resize this a little bit. Now currently, the objects panel has two sub-tabs. I really don't like for those to be separate because I access those a lot. So I can actually move these in the same way. The difference is I can only move these within the objects panel. So I'll drag behavior down and have it appear at the bottom of this panel. 
If I had a larger screen, I would do the same thing with the library panel, but in this case, I'll just leave it as is. Next, let's talk about a few more properties of these objects. So if we click the knob, we see we've got X and Y control. This controls the position of the object on the, on the interface here. The width and the height, in case you want to specify them numerically instead of dragging the handles. We're going to skip this for now since it's specific to the knob. The label, we can turn on or off the label, which is essentially just showing the name of the knob. The value, which shows the current value of the knob. Now, if you want to hold the E key down on your keyboard, you can actually interact with these objects as if you were using uh, an iPad or iPhone, the app version of Lemur. Let's click that again. Um, if we want to have a unit showing, we can. Uh, Hertz, for example, HZ. Now notice that it gets bumped right up against the numbers, so if we want a space before it, we just need to put a space here, and then it shows up like we'd probably like it. Precision controls the number of decimal points. So because our range of the control is actually 0 to 1, this isn't going to show anything until we get halfway from 0 to 1, and then it shows a 1. And that's important to note that all controls actually send the value of 0 to 1 to their destination by default. In order to understand that, we need to talk about variables a little bit. We've seen our first variable already here where it says value equals x. Well, what is x and where does it come from? If we take a look back at the project panel and click the triangle next to the filter cutoff knob, we'll see two letters underneath filter cutoff, x and z. These are called variables. These hold values internally, even though you'll never see their values explicitly unless you have monitors such as the label here or uh, another object that allows you to see live values of objects such as this monitor. I'll show you how to use that a little bit later though. So the x variable you'll find is common to very many of the objects in the palette. If we click the fader, we can also see that there's an x variable inside of it as well. x always represents the value of the object. In this case, it's the value 0 to 1 as we slide up and down. In this case, it's the value 0 to 1 as we go from left all the way around to right. Now z, on the other hand, changes to 1 when you press down on a control and changes back to zero when you let up on a control. Now that's a little bit hard to see right now because there's nothing displaying its value. So let's bring this monitor back in that we had a while ago. Now for the value of the monitor, we don't want to have a specific value. We actually want it to show the value of the z variable in the filter cutoff knob, for example. Well, we know that z is our variable that we'd like to see, but how do we name it? There's a z here and there's a z here. Which one is the monitor going to choose? What we do is we use the name of the object, followed by a dot, then followed by the variable that we'd like to reference. In this case, we'll type filter cutoff dot z. Now we only need a precision of 0 because it's only a 0 or 1 value. So now, when we press down, I'm going to hold E on the keyboard and click. As long as my mouse is held down, the value of Z is displayed as 1, and then when I let go, the value of Z goes back to 0. If we'd like to increase our precision back to 2 and change the variable that the monitor is displaying to X instead of Z, we can. Now we see that it's 0.29. Here it shows 0 hertz still because on the control itself we're still limiting the precision to 0. So let's change that to 2 as well just so they're consistent. Now if I hold down E, as I change the control, you can see that the monitor is displaying the value of x as expected. So we've said that all of these objects actually send the range of 0 to 1 by default. What if we want a different range? Many parameters of synthesizers, for example, go from 0 to 127. So how would we get an output of 0 to 127? Well, let's start with the monitor here. 
What we're asking for its value to be is the pure, unaltered value of x. But we can actually write any mathematical equation right here. For example, we can press times 127. And now suddenly, the monitor is displaying a value in the range of 0 to 127 because it's multiplying the value of 0 to 1 by 127. The same thing can be done on the knob itself. Instead of displaying the value of x, we can display the value of x times 127. So once again, the monitor and this value are in sync as they were a while ago. Now it's important to note that this value is not what gets sent out to a parameter or device. This is simply for display only. If you wanted to send out a different value, you would need to create a variable of your own. First click the object that you want the variable to be a part of. Then at the bottom click the little x equals question mark button. Let's call this simply out and press OK. So we've created a new variable. Now we get to define what it is. Well, what do we want? We want x times 127. Now let's change the monitor to refer to our newly created out variable rather than performing the equation right here. Note that it's still showing the same value. The difference is that because this is a variable now, it can be sent to another device via the OSC or MIDI settings, which we haven't talked about yet. Okay, well there's definitely more we could say about variables, but before we get too far off track, let's get back to some more of our parameters and behaviors of the knob. The last thing we looked at was precision and units. Next we have the option to change the background and foreground color of the control. If you'd like to save any color in order to reuse it from object to object, just drag the color from this swatch over into one of the empty slots. You'll see that it then appears in the background as well, or in another control. Now if you haven't rearranged your interface to look like mine, you may still have the Behavior tab next to the Properties tab. So in that case, click it in order to see the behaviors of this object. Let's click back on the knob. We have a grid setting, so it's possible to set most controls up to a grid spacing of, I believe it's 33. We simply click this checkbox and then enter the number of spaces we'd like to have on the control. What this does is it locks both the interface and the value that actually gets output to the number of increments that you specify using the grid setting. Right now we've still got this label scaling from 0 to 127. Let's just set this back down to X so it's easier to see what's going on. Now when we drag the control, we see it goes from 0 to 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, and 1. So that's a total of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 values, just as we've specified here in the grid setting. Before we continue, let's turn off the grid so we can set the value of this control to any amount we want. The next few settings, cursor mode, control, and physics, affect the physics of actually using the knob control. So I'm not going to cover those right now because they're very specific to the knob control. Attraction, friction, and speed similarly set and configure how the control behaves visually. I will demonstrate a couple of these because it will come in handy in order to demonstrate how faders can be used to control these parameters. Let's start with attraction. Attraction, as the little pop-up text tells us, can be any value between 0 and 1. Attraction affects how quickly the value of the knob jumps to our cursor whenever we click. Right now it's set to a value of 1, which means it's immediate. Let's change it to 0.5 instead. Now whenever we click, it takes a little bit longer for the knob to reach the value nearest our cursor. Let's change it down to 0.1. This should make the effect a little bit more obvious. As you can see, it's now much slower to approach the value selected by our mouse. Clicking back on the fader, next we have friction. Friction also determines a certain physical aspect of our knob, 
but as the help text says here, mass spring only. In order to configure this setting, we need to change the physics from interpolate mode to mass spring mode. Now, if we choose a friction setting of 0.5 and then click somewhere on the knob, we notice that right now, because the attraction is set to such a low number, it approaches so quickly that there's no speed. So let's give it a stronger attraction. Let's put it back to 1 like it was at the beginning. Now when we click someplace, you can see that because we've set the physics to mass spring mode, it kind of bounces back and forth around our cursor rather than jumping and staying on a particular value. The friction setting is what controls the behavior of the wobbling back and forth that you see. If we change it to a number much closer to zero, you'll see that it, it'll wobble a long time, whereas if we change it to a number closer to one, like 0 0.8, and when we click it will wobble barely and then come to a stop. Now I don't want to cover every parameter and every behavior of every control because these controls are very well documented in the manual. If you open up the Lima reference manual and go to chapter 12, you'll see the object reference section. This section has all the details you'll need for every object in Lima. Now there are one or two new controls introduced in Lemur 5 that won't be in the manual, but you can look in the addendum manual for those details. If we scroll down, we'll see the behavior and the attributes, all specified and detailed. Here's the container control, custom buttons, faders, and on and on. All the controls and all the details you'll find in this section of the manual. Now while we can make use of these, what we're really more interested in is how all the pieces fit together. It's nice to have something visually move back and forth or the control behave in a particular way, and it's good to know that. Since that can easily be found in the manual, the things that we'll talk about here in this video have much more to do with the way that you can use objects to control one another, the way that you can use scripts, etc. So a few minutes ago, when we were looking at the behaviors of the knob, I mentioned that you could hook up faders to control these values. Let me show you how you can easily do that because it's a fun way to play around with the physics in order to get a feel for the way that they work on your own. So first I'll make this bigger just for the fun of it. I'll make use of this one fader that we've already got. Resize it a little bit. And I'm going to command C and command V this fader just to make uh, three all together. So the plan here is to use one fader for each of these physics behaviors of the knob. We have attraction, friction, and speed. So first it's probably a good idea to label these. Attraction, friction, and speed. Let's select all three faders by dragging a selection around them. We can turn all their labels on at once. Let's go ahead and turn their values on as well so we can keep an eye on things and change the precision down to two decimal places. All right, so you might think at first, as I did when I first started using Lemur, that there should be something I put on the fader that sends its value over to the knob when I make a change to this fader. Uh, but Lemur actually works backwards in this way, in this situation. What you want to do is change what's written here. So you remember earlier when we saw the value refer to the x variable in order to display the current value of x just below the label of the knob. Well similarly each of these faders has an x variable, right? Let's go ahead and open these up. We've got our attraction, we've got our friction, and we've got our speed, and each of them has an x variable. And we said previously that x refers to the value that corresponds to when you move the control up and down, right? So putting all those pieces together, if we click on the knob, the attraction setting, we can just type attraction.x. For friction, we can type friction.x. And for speed, we can type speed 
dot x. So now, whenever I change this value, or change this value, or change this value, I'm actually affecting the physics of this knob. Admittedly, it's a lot more fun to play with this sort of thing on an iPad or other device, but we can give it a go here. So I think earlier we set attraction to 1. We can say friction is 1 and speed is 1 for now. So when we click, the value jumps immediately. If we were to change the attraction down to 0.27, now when we click, it takes a long time for the value to actually reach our cursor. The friction is very high right now, so maybe we need to reduce that to make it go faster. Yeah, that made a little bit of a difference. But if we reduce the friction even more, then we'll get that wobble that we saw earlier. Finally, speed. If we turn the speed down, we'll see that it just affects the overall speed of the knob. Let's go ahead and get rid of this monitor for now since it's just giving us bogus values. Alright, so that's a general introduction to how you can use faders or other controls to easily adjust the parameters of an object by taking advantage of their x variables. Now let's talk about variable scope. If you remember earlier when we had what was called our volume fader at the time and we had this set to x times 127 in order to scale the label between 0 and 127 we also had a monitor control out here, right? And the monitor we had set to the attraction.x variable, and we typed attraction.x here times 127. So why is it that for the monitor I have to type attraction.x, but for the fader itself I can just type x? It might seem obvious, but the real reason is slightly deeper than what seems obvious here. X is a variable that is inside the attraction object. Therefore, the attraction object, in essence, owns the X variable, so to speak, as well as any other variable that we happen to create, such as an out variable we did for an example earlier. Now, earlier, for the out variable, we set it to the expression X times 1, 27. Once again, we're able to refer to this x without having to say attraction. That's because attraction, in essence, acts as the parent of all these variables, and these variables you could think of as acting like siblings to one another. And parents know their children, and siblings know their brothers and sisters. But once you get out of that relationship, then you have to start specifying exactly whose children you're talking about. If you want to talk about a variable such as z that's outside of this little attraction family, you wouldn't know which z you meant. So it becomes, of course, necessary to say friction.z or speed.z. Now even if these variables were unique, even if you had abc under here in friction and xyz in speed, it's still necessary to specify the object name followed by the variable name in order to be specific. Now there's another type of scope which is outside of an object. For example, if we click either the project or this is called an interface, we haven't talked about it, but we'll come back to that. Let's create another variable. Um, let's call this output2. Alright, now whether you have the interface selected or the project selected, output2 will be outside of any interface and any object. Now output2 is what's referred to as a global variable. Any object in any interface can refer to or call on output2. For example, if I wanted to change this out, this of course wouldn't make any sense, but just for an example, I could change this out to be output2 times 127. Notice how when I'm typing, it becomes red if there's a mistake and it turns black when everything is fine, well clearly Lemur has accepted the fact that output 2 can be seen even from within this attraction object. So that means when you're coming out of an object or out of a container, another thing we haven't quite talked about yet, 
But going up the hierarchy and then diving back down into the hierarchy, that's when you need to specify the names of things followed by a dot, followed by the variable name. When you're only going up the hierarchy and not coming back down, then you can just refer to variables by their name alone. Alright, I think that's enough about variable scope. You'll get the picture more and more as you work with lemur, but I wanted to at least give you a general understanding of the way that it works and how you can refer to variables either in the same scope or in a different scope. Within our discussion about variable scope, I mentioned two things that we haven't talked about yet, interfaces and containers. So let's have a look at those in the same order. This I said is called an interface. An interface is basically an entire set of controls you have on the screen. You can have multiple interfaces per project. Simply click create interface and then choose a name. Each interface also has a properties section where you can change the name if you like. For example, if you were working with a synthesizer, you might have one interface for the LFO section, and you might have another interface for the filter section, either via scripts or via tabs that are located at the top of the iPad interface. You can change from one interface to another easily. This is one of two ways that makes it easy to change between whole sets of controls. The other way is through containers. So containers are actually a type of object. They can fill the whole screen if you like, but they don't have to. You may have seen containers used in some of the fancier interfaces where they'll break up a single interface into multiple segments like this. And each container had tabs. Well, it's easy to add tabs to a container, but before we do that, let's see how to put things into a container and how that affects our project hierarchy. So let's go ahead and say we want to add all of these things to this container down here. I'm going to cut the objects first, Command X, resize my container to make sure it's big enough to fit the objects, and then click inside of it and press Paste, Command V. Now you see that if I try and drag this object, it doesn't go outside of the container, so we know it's inside the container. We also know it's inside the container because we see here that container 2, which is the name of our container, now has listed underneath it in the hierarchy attraction, filter cutoff, friction, and speed, whereas monitor, on the other hand, is still outside of any container, so it's justified at the same level of the hierarchy as our two containers. Now if we wanted to add tabs to this container, we could simply right click on it and say make tabbed. This gives us one tab, which is called default. We can add another tab if we like by right clicking and saying add tab and choosing a name. Now we've got two tabs. If I hold E on the keyboard, I can switch between the two tabs. I need to hold E because this is actually an interface element. If I'd like to rename a tab, I first need to select the tab. You can either click the tab over in the project or click the background within any tab. You know you have the right thing selected when the properties panel shows the name of the tab. I can simply type a new name and then click outside of it. Notice how when I first changed to the tab I've got the actual entire container selected and at this point I'm seeing the containers properties rather than the tabs properties. That's why I must click on either the background of the container or select the tab from the project list before renaming it. I can also move tabs back and forth by right clicking and either saying bring down or bring up. Down and up is kind of a confusing way to think about it, but just think about it as left and right. Now let's move our monitor. I'm going to cut it, Command X, go back to our other tab, click inside and press paste. And now we can swap between two sets of interface elements still within a single interface called filter. So in summary, you can think of interfaces as pages and you can think of containers as some sort of dynamic web content that allows you to flip between more than one thing without going to a different web page. I'm going to go ahead and 
delete our interface and delete this variable and delete this other interface. So in half an hour we've covered quite a bit of the basics of lemur. I wanted to cover not just simple basics like how to create a nice looking interface, but rather the deeper aspects of lemur and hopefully you've got a little bit of a feel for how the internals work. There's so much more to cover, um, but I think I'm going to end this video here. Please post your feedback. If you find this type of video useful, I might make another follow-up one to continue to look at a lot more of what's possible. Thank you.